Hi everyone, today we will read a drama namely Sea Stoops to Conquer written by Oliver Goldsmith. So first of all we will read about the author Oliver Goldsmith who was an Irish born British essayist, poet, novelist and a dramatist. Goldsmith attended the Trinity College in Dublin before studying medicine in Edinburgh. Settling in London, he began writing essays, some of which were collected in The Citizen of the World, 1762. In 1764, he became an original member of Samuel Johnson's famous club, and he won a reputation as a poet with The Traveller, 1764 and confirmed by his famous pastoral elegy, The Deserted Village, 1770, and The Vicar of Wakefield, 1766, revealed his skill as a novelist. The charming force, She Stoops to Conquer, written in 1773, was his most effective play, noted for his exceptionally graceful, lively style. Goldsmith was a friend of many literary light of his day, who agreed that he was one of the oddest personalities of his time. So, Sea Stoops to Conquer is also known as The Mistakes of a Knight and it's a comedy and starting with a letter to Samuel Johnson, LLD and then a prologue by David Garrick. So, starts with a prologue, I um, will explain. Say Stoops to Conquer opens with a prologue in which an actor mourns the death of a classical low comedy at the altar of sentimental mockish comedy. He hopes that Dr. Goldsmith can remedy this poem problem through the play about to be presented. The prologue is attributed to David Garrick, a popular actor of his day. The basic premises of the prologue is that the comic arts are passing away and that Dr. Goldsmith might prove the doctor and see troops to conquer as the medicine that will seize its death. At the, uh, at the play's opening, Mr. Woodward enters and speaks a prologue. Woodward, a celebrated actor of his day, one who had turned down the role of a Tony Lumpkin. In the play's initial production is drying his eyes as though he has been crying. In the words, Woodward laments to the audience that the comic muse long sick is now a dying. As an actor trained in comedy, he intuits that his own career will pass away along with comedy itself. Since he can as soon speak Greek as sentiments, unable to tell moralistic sentimental stories, he fears for the fate of himself and his brethren. He attempts to tell a moral poem beginning with all his gold that glitters. But performs poorly and stops himself, he offers one final hope for his problem. A doctor has come this night to show his skill, perhaps to make the audience love through his five draught of medicine, to accept the doctor's comic medicine willingly, to laugh heartily and stresses that should the doctor's goal not be achieved, then they can hold it against him and deny him his fee. So start with the act one, I will only summarize, so act one and scene one. So the play opens in its primary setting, a chamber in the old fashioned country house of Mr. Hardcastle and Mr. and Mrs. Hardcastle, uh, Mrs. Hardcastle is perturbed at her husband refusal to take trip into London, which he insists that he is not interested in the vanity and affection of the city. And he dislikes the pretentious London train that they find their way into his removed country community. Mrs. Hardcastle mocks him for his love of old fashioned trains so much that he keeps his house in such a way that it looks for all the world like a inn. Then Tony Lumpkin is their only son and Mr. Hardcastle finds his ruggish ways grating. On the other hand, Mrs. Hardcastle uh, Tony's natural mother defends him. They grant that Tony is too inclined towards drink and jokes. Tony passes by and tells them that he is off to the Three Pigeons, a local pub. Mr. Hardcastle says how the modern fashion have infiltrated their lives and worries that even his own daughter Kate 
has been infected by those fashion because of her having lived for a few years in London. Kate, Miss Hardcastle enter and reminds her father of an agreement in which the morning she dresses as she likes in order to welcome friend, while in the evening she dresses plainly in order to please his taste. Mr. Hardcastle gives the news that he has invited Mr. Marlowe, the son of Hardcastle old friend Charles Marlowe, to their house that evening to court Kate. Hardcastle has chosen Marlowe as husband for her, but she is immediately worried uh, that their interview will be overly formal and dull. Her father insists to her that Marlowe, while generous, brave and handsome, is best known for being reserved. He leaves to prepare the servant and Kate laments that uh, she might have to spend her life with a boring man and she begins to wonder whether she might be able to find a way to be happy even in such a marriage or whether she can change him. Constance Neville, a cousin of fate, cousin of Kate, a niece of Mr. Hardcastle, lives with the Hardcastle. Constance reveals that this, they know, uh, she knows Marlowe's reputation since Marlowe is a friend of Mr. Hastings. Her admirer and man C hopes to marry. Constance tells her that the Marlowe is known for excessive formality amongst women of reputation and virtue, but that he is a very different character amongst, uh, amongst common women. Then they discuss how Mr., uh, Mrs. Hardcastle desperately wants Constance to marry her son, Tony, in which Mm, in the hopes of keeping Constance's small fortune in consist of some jewel bequeathed to her in the family, Constance quite, uh, quite hates Tony and her only small com comfort is that Tony hates her equally. Scene 2 starting the setting changes to the room in the three pigeons where Tony fraternizes with several other drunk men. They all urge Tony to sing a song and he sings of how liquor provides the best learning where traditional school wisdom can be ignorance. The song also touches on the hypocrisy of man of manners. They also reminisces to themselves about Tony's father was the finest gentleman. The landlord brings the news uh, to gentlemen have arrived and are lost on the way to Miss Hardcastle house. Tony quickly intuits that they must be Marlowe and Hastings. Since Tony is angry about Hardcastle's insult, he has made up his mind to play joke on his stepfather. Tony will convince them that Hardcastle House in, is in fact an inn and so will they present themselves there not as gracious guests but as entitled patrons. Marlowe and Hastings are in poor spirits because of a long day of travel, Hastings being more so because Marlowe's reserve prevented him from asking direction. Tony gives them nonsensical direction which make the place sound many miles away when it is in fact that it down to the road. When Tony interrogates them, they tell how they have heard about Hardcastle well-bred daughter and Ruggie's spoiled son. Tony argues that their information is reserved, that the son himself is much loved and the daughter is talkative maypole. The man asks the landlord if they can stay but at Tony's instruction he tells them that uh, there is no room and so Tony suggests that they head down to a nearby inn he knows of. Tony uh, cautions them that the landlord there puts on air and expect to be treated as a gentleman rather than servant. Thinking him they set, out, set off for Hardcastle home, thus the stage is set for the comedy to come.